This video is EOC Review Unit 5. This is of the cell. Uh, I will only cover parts of the cell, cell cycle in this video, and photosynthesis and cellular respiration are already posted, and so we will look at those in other videos. <laughs> so just a real quick history of the cell. A few names you should be familiar with. That of Robert Hooke. Hooke is the first one to see cells. Um, Another one, or the first one to see a cell and call it a cell. I think it's a more accurate way to describe that. Another one by the man by the name of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, and he was the first to actually see living cells, pond water, what he observed. And then two guys by the name of can't spell it right. Two guys, Sleden and Schwann, and Schleden was the first to say that all plants are made of cells, and Schwann said all animals are made of cells. And then last but not least was our friend Rudolf Virchow, and what he said is that all cells come from pre-existing cells. And these men and their work came up with this idea of the cell theory, which has three basic ideas, and that is that cells are the basic unit of life. This is the smallest unit of life. That all living things Composed of cells, and that all new cells come from pre existing cells. All right, I'm just going to give up on that one. That is the cell theory. Again, it's a theory, but it's simply an explanation. It's what we use to explain the way that cells work. Now, there are three characteristics of all cells, whether they're a bacteria or a brain cell. All cells have three things. First, a plasma membrane. Second, all cells have cytoplasm. And lastly, all cells have genetic material. Two different kinds of cells. There are prokaryotic cells. Karyotic cells. and eukaryotic cells. Now, what are the differences between these two things? Well, prokaryotic cells have no nucleus. So obviously eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. There's no membrane-bound organelles. They do have things like ribosomes, but no membrane-bound organelles, whereas eukaryotic cells has many organelles and prokaryotic cells are typically a small single chromosome eukaryotic cells can have many chromosomes prokaryotic cells typically very small not very complex example would be bacteria whereas eukaryotic cells are extremely complex and are, <laughs> their complexity is even still yet unknown, really. This is examples of prokaryotic cells are things like animal cells and plant cells. All right, now, speaking of animal cells and plant cells, what are the big differences? Animal cells versus plant cells. Just a few major differences that we want to point out. 
animal cells have organelles called centrioles. Animal cells can also have something called cilia and flagella. And animal cells also have something called lysosomes. Now, some plant cells have been found to have lysosomes, but as a rule, it's mostly an animal cell thing. Plant cells have something called a cell wall, a large central vacuole, and chloroplasts. Now, one common mistake that people will do is they'll say, well, animal cells have mitochondria. Yes, they do, but so do plant cells. So don't get that mixed up. All cell, all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. Not all cells have a chloroplast. So let's go over a few of these organelles just real fast in their function. What is an organelle? It's just a specialized small structure inside the cell. Now, first you have the cytoplasm itself. And this is just the area between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Uh, it's like the liquid portion. It contains all the nutrients and the minerals essential for the cell. Then you have the nucleus. The nucleus is the control center of the cell. How does it do that? Well, the nucleus contains DNA. DNA codes for proteins, and proteins are essential from almost every single cellular process. Next are ribosomes. Ribosomes are where proteins are made. Now, it's more complicated than that. You know that, but we'll get there eventually. Then there is the endomembrane system. There is the rough ER, or the endo endoplasmic reticulum is the ER. There's the rough and smooth ERs. And the endoplasmic reticulum is part of this endomembrane system near the nucleus, involved in the production and transport of cellular components, things like proteins. And the rough version of that is <coughs> covered with ribosomes. So proteins are made there. The smooth version of that is the site of lipid synthesis for the membrane and also some cell de detoxification. And the Golgi apparatus, so rough and smooth ER, and also the Golgi. And the Golgi is for shipping and packaging of materials that you're going to leave the cell. And this endomembrane system essentially works to Proteins are made here. They're sent via a vesicle to the Golgi body. There they are, a label is put on them essentially. And that label kind of tells it where it's going and what, and it tells the receiving cell, this is what it is. And from there it leaves the cell. Lysosomes. These are membrane sacs that break down and recycle old materials. Vacuoles, these are storage, particularly for water, other nutrients. Mitochondria, the site of cellular respiration. Chloroplasts. This is the site of photosynthesis. The cytoskeleton, which I won't write down, so this gives the cell structure and support. And then there are also something called cilia and flagella, and these allow the cell to move. Now, real quickly, I want to talk about how transport works across the cell now again plasma membrane 
it's made up of something called these phospholipids and it's called a bilipid membrane layer because their lipids are turned like this and the inside of that is not polar or nonpolar excuse me and the outside is polar and in order to get across the membrane things have to have a particular molecular structure or they have to have some help now this membrane is called semipermeable for this reason not all things are able to get across it and so there are different kinds of transport across the membrane so here's a membrane here bilipid membrane and the way that most cells work is they do something by called building up a concentration gradient now a concentration gradient is just where the concentration of a particular material is higher on one side of the membrane than it is on the other and this is how your cell does work now what will happen over time is these materials will naturally pass across the membrane until there is an equal amount of materials on both sides this process of these materials passing across the membrane is called diffusion diffusion is just the movement of particles from a high concentration to a low concentration and those particles will continue to move until they are at equilibrium and then that movement becomes equal on both sides well this will hap this happens without using any energy sometimes it's called passive transport because it doesn't require any energy now water can also move in this way so let's take a look here we've got a membrane here in the middle and on this side we've got let's say salt particles on the left and nothing on the right well we would expect salt to move to the right except let's say this membrane doesn't allow salt to pass through well this solution is 10% salt and 90% water over here we have a hundred percent water remember what we just said particles want to move from an area of high concentration to low which side has the highest concentration of water the right side so which way is water going to move to the left the movement of water is called osmosis now with water and talking about solutions we have a couple other terms we would say that this side is hypertonic because it has the most solution or the most solute this side is hypotonic water always moves from hypotonic to hypertonic remember it's hypertonic because it has more solute hypotonic because of less solutes let's do an example here here's a bowl or something in the middle is a, uh, a nice raisin well inside the raisin there's a high concentration of raisin and outside the raisin there is zero raisin so we would say that the inside of the raisin is hypertonic the outside of the raisin is hypotonic now if we leave that raisin overnight where's the water going to go from hypo to hyper and we would expect that raisin to do what overnight grow so I don't know what that baby was anyway the raisin grows because water moves from hypo Hyper. Now that's passive transport, but you can also have active transport. And active transport is that sort of transport that requires energy. Usually means, so going back to our concentration gradient, in order to create a concentration gradient like that, in order to push everything back up the hill, as it were, you have to need energy in order to do that.